All right, guys, so good evening. Just to get everything started and make sure everyone's in the right room, this is the final exam review session for anatomy, so Z003733. So if any of you guys mean to be here for a different subject, and this isn't the one you're looking for, you can always go ask the SARC front desk for the room you are actually looking for, just making sure everyone's in for the right subject. To give you guys a preview of what we're gonna do, um, this block has a lot of pictures on it, so what I'm actually gonna do is I'm gonna go through each picture that you guys are gonna see on your exam. We're gonna go through the basic labeling, like what you should know on the picture, and then I'm gonna go through secondary questions, so clinical points related to the picture, just facts you should know, things you might not have caught during lecture. So we're gonna go through that for all the pictures in your exam. And so that'll take care of all the clinicals and extra things you need to know for chapters 10, 11, and parts of nine. And then we're gonna go through five and hit all the clinicals there. And if we have any extra time at the end, we're gonna focus a little more on blood supply and any other questions you guys might have, we'll get them answered. So are you guys ready to get started? Yeah, for sure, I'll let you guys know. And if you guys can see, I'll have it up here. So if I don't mention it, if I don't mention the page number or what figure it is, just tell me and I'll mention it. All right, so you guys ready to get started? Okay, awesome. So first things first, here we're gonna see a frontal picture of our oral cavity. What you guys need to know off start for basics is this opening of your mouth, what do we call it? Yeah, awesome, oral cavity proper. In between your lips and your gingiva, or your gums, is what you can call the vestibule of the mouth. So going through what you should know for labeling are just some of the surface muscle features you can see like this, little dangly thing as a lot of people call it is your uvula. It's a protrusion of your uvula muscle. Then you have your folds. Can you guys see this picture okay or should I zoom in? We're good? Okay, I'll zoom in a little bit. So then you have your two folds. The fold that's most anterior is closest to the tongue. You can call that your palatoglossal fold. You can know that because it's closer to your tongue and the palate region, so it's palatoglossal. The fold that's farther back, what do you guys think we would call that? Awesome, palatopharyngeus. It's still in our palate, it's part of our soft palate, but it's closer to our pharynx. So remember we have nasopharynx, oropharynx, and hypopharynx. So that will be our palatopharyngeal fold. Now we have our tonsils right here. Do you guys remember which tonsils these are? Awesome, we have our palatine tonsil, tonsils. A little bit of extra things, this little piece of skin right here is what actually will secure your lip to your gingiva. You have the same thing under your tongue. It's called a frenulum. He typically doesn't ask about that, but it's kind of important to know. So clinical points in regards to this picture, I'm just gonna jot them down right next to the picture while we talk. You can't see it here, but it's important to know while we talk about the oral cavity proper is one of our biggest salivary glands, the parotid gland. So parotid gland is a salivary gland. How are we gonna get that saliva into the mouth? What's the name of that duct? Awesome, so we're gonna get that into the mouth via Stenson's duct. Do we know where Stenson's duct opens? Excellent, so it opens at the upper second molar. Not too much extra going on for this picture. I'm focusing a lot on the pictures because they're basically like free points I don't want you guys to miss. It's really easy to get a lot of points from these pictures. So since we hit parotid gland, let's hit our smaller ones, our sublingual and our submandibular. So these both it doesn't mention too much in the book. You can just think of them as draining into the oral cavity proper. But what are the names of the ducts draining these respective glands? So Bartholin's duct for sublingual or submandibular? So for sublingual, she said Bartholin's duct. Awesome, Bartholin's duct. And now what about for submandibular? That's the W. You got a Wharton's duct. Awesome, so Wharton's duct. It's important to recognize these ducts by name and know which glands they are associated with. So talking about some other clinicals and golden senses we might have, 
we're going to start with our next picture because they're both pretty commonly and closely associated. This is a posterior view of our oropharynx or just in general our pharyngeal area. So starting off with structures you'll need to recognize. You need to recognize a lot of the musculature for this picture. So when we go through it, these are our constrictor muscles, our constrictor pharyngeal muscles. We have our superior, we have our middle, and we have our inferior. Okay, so we have our three pharyngeal constrictor muscles. Those help us actually swallow with the peristalsis. And now there are these three muscles in here. These are extremely important to know. He likes to test on these. So I'm going to zoom in, and we can talk a little bit more about those. Okay. Hopefully you guys can see that okay. This really thin one right here, what do we call that muscle? So that really thin one right here is called salpingo pharyngeus. Salpingo, I like to think about it like as a little tube, because if you guys remember our clinical point, salpingitis is infection of the fallopian tubes, also a very thin, small tube. That's kind of how I use that to remember. This next one, awesome, levator veli palatini. This one is kind of the oddball. I don't really have a good mnemonic for it, but the other one is one of my favorites. It's really nice and tucked away behind the levator veli palatini. Awesome, tensor veli palatini. So salpingo pharyngeus is most superficial. So S salpingo for superficial. T tensor veli palatini is tucked away underneath levator veli palatini. So that's kind of a little wordplay to help you guys remember those if you have any trouble with that. So going on to any clinical points we have regarding this picture, we talked about our palate or our palatine area. So we know any palatine muscles are innervated by what nerve plexus? Awesome, pharyngeal plexus. And if my writing ever goes off the screen and you guys can't see it, just please tell me so I can zoom out or move my paper. All right, so our palatine muscles are innervated by our pharyngeal plexus. What nerves make up our pharyngeal plexus? Excellent, nine, 10, and 11. So 11 is kind of our oddball out in this section. 10 is gonna be our sensory or our motor. Awesome, 10 is our motor branch for this plexus. And nine, sensory, excellent. Now an important fact to keep in mind, cranial nerve nine, is motor to only one muscle. Awesome, stylopharyngeus. So stylopharyngeus is the only muscle that is innervated by cranial nerve nine that is motor. Now another muscle we just saw in our picture was the tensor veli palatini. That is a muscle of the palatine group, but it doesn't follow this golden sentence. It is one of the exceptions. Do you guys remember what cranial nerve innervates it? Excellent, cranial nerve five. So now that we have the knowledge we need about our pharyngeal plexus, we can talk about some things that it'll actually take care of. So gag reflex. Whenever we have a reflex, we have an afferent and an efferent branch. So our afferent, being our sensory, is which one? Excellent, cranial nerve nine, making our efferent, or our motor, I abbreviate EFF, cranial nerve 10. This gag reflex is stimulated by touching the uvula, or the uvulae muscle. And just to kind of sum up any palate, palate um, clinical points we have, mumps was one of those infections you guys needed to know. Mumps will typically infect the parotid gland. And it'll lead to some things we're gonna see later on, but one fact I do kinda want you guys to know is that if mumps progresses and it becomes very severe, it can actually lead to infertility. Are you 
guys good so far? Is this pace okay? Awesome. So one fact some people kind of clump together, but you guys should keep separate, is the fact that um, facial nerve paralysis, so paralysis of cranial nerve 7, if it proceeds untreated, can cause Bell's palsy. So Bell's palsy, you'll see, is drooping of one half of the face. It's kind of similar to Horner's syndrome, but Horner's syndrome is a sympathetic plexus problem. So it's a pathology of the sympathetic plexus. Okay. There's no tongue picture that you guys need to know for your exam, so we're going to hit those clinical points here. All tongue muscles, or you can call them lingual muscles, so all tongue muscles are innervated by which cranial nerve? Awesome, by 12, hypoglossal nerve. This is one of the only times we really see 12 come into a big play. I know he showed a picture of this during lecture and I know he likes to ask about it. Macroglossia, right? Yeah, macroglossia. Macroglossia, do you guys remember what that is? Awesome. Macro means big. Glossus is our tongue. So it's that really big swollen tongue. There are a couple of different things that can cause that, such as hypothyroidism. Amyloidosis. Amyloidosis is just a deposit of excess protein called amyloid. It's amyloid protein. So pretty easy name to remember. And creatinism. Good. If it goes untreated, it can actually get to the point where the person can't swallow and then can't breathe because their tongue is obstructing their airways. This one is creatinism. C-R-E-T-I-N-I-S-M. All right, you guys ready to move on? Excellent. So next picture is one of my personal favorites. This is the cross section of the retina. So there's a couple layers of the retina you guys will need to know. I'll line up the paper so we can label them as we go. But this uppermost layer, do you guys remember what that is? Excellent, optic nerve fibers. Good. So what about our next layer? So you say ganglion cells? I like it. Sounds good. Ganglion cells. These, I like to use these layers as landmarks. What do we call this layer? So I heard intersynaptic plexus. Excellent. So intersynaptic plexus. We're going to follow that up with this area right here. I got a little out of order because that word is kind of long. So what are these? So awesome. This is our internuclear layer. Internuclear layer. So we had our intersynaptic plexus. What should we call this? Awesome. Our outer and I'm just going to write synaptic, so I don't run out of space. Our outer synaptic plexus. Then we have these cell bodies. Cell bodies of what type of cells? Excellent. Cell bodies of rods and cones. And then we go down. Sorry, that should be the ganglia of rods and cones. Now we come down, and then we have these cell bodies. Ganglia. Then we follow up with our cell bodies. And then we finish up, finish up down here. I don't know if he's going to ask you guys this far down, but it's always safe. So this layer, you can see, you might not be able to see up there, but definitely look in your textbook. Sorry, I forgot to mention, this is page 625, figure 1110. Okay, yeah, sorry, forgot I'm using the second edition. Or 661. 
Okay, so this bottom layer of cells is called a pigment cell. So this is the pigment layer. And then down here, our last, it looks like our basal layer is the choroid. So remember, you have three layers to your eye. You have your retina, your choroid, and then your sclera. All right, so this is easy. You have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight layers that you could be asked on. He'll probably ask for about six of them. That's 12 points right there. That's a whole letter grade's worth of points. Okay, so I know this picture very well. Now going into some clinical points. Okay, so glaucoma. The cause of glaucoma is an obstruction. And obstruction in what structure? In our anterior chamber, specifically our canal of Schlem. A Schlem's canal will actually drain that intraocular fluid into the trabecular network to keep intraocular pressure down. And when it's obstructed, that pressure increases and can cause glaucoma. So other ones are pretty straightforward, like cataracts. It's just the haziness of the optic lens that's caused by a protein dep deposition. One of the weird things that trips up a lot of people is the function of the ciliary muscle. When the ciliary muscle contracts, it actually thickens the optic lens. So remember, we have our ciliary muscle, our zonular fibers, and those will attach to our optic lens. And the thickening of the lens has to do with the crisscross pattern of these fibers, of the zonular fibers. So when it's actually pulled tight, it has a weird reverse effect and actually thickens the lens. Excellent, not too much in here. Um, pay a little bit of attention to the blood supply. I know he likes to ask these for secondary questions. So when we start out with our ophthalmic artery, actually going towards the eye, he'll give you a couple different options, but just remember, as you can see right here, up here at the top to follow the blood supply. Our ophthalmic artery will actually turn into our central retinal artery. And that's how a lot of the internal blood supply is brought to the eye. Okay. One of my personal favorites, because there's a lot to go on here, is the tympanic membrane. So covering the tympanic membrane, let's just cover our quick labeling here. We have our pars flaccida. We have our pars tensa. And now what is this? Awesome, the cone of light. So what we're actually going to see is you can see here the head of the malus, and you can see where the malus presses up against the tympanic membrane, because that's what holds it. And that'll take us into our clinical points. So tensor tympani muscle. What's the innervation for tensor tympani? Awesome, trigeminal, cranial nerve, five. Um, one thing I like to say for this one is I use TTT. So tensor tympani trigeminal. It's also how I remember Tensor veli palatini is cranial nerve 5, so trigeminal for tensor veli palatini. So while we're talking about these muscles, let's talk about stapedius muscle. Yeah, cranial nerve 5, branch 3. Thank you for that detail. Oh yeah, that's a good point. So you brought that up. There's three T's. So that'll help you remember specifically mandibular branch of cranial nerve 5. It's a good point. Thank you. So stapedius muscle, I like to use stapedius S for seven, cranial nerve seven. What do we call that? What's another name for it? Excellent, facial nerve. Okay, so while we're talking about this, again, like I said, the labeling on these pictures should be free points for you guys. That's why this exam is one of the most straightforward exams because there's a lot of labeling. Stapedius muscle, if you have injury to stapedius muscle, 
or cranial nerve 7, you can cause hyperacusis. So hyperacusis is when someone speaks to you normally or the way I'm speaking to you right now, and it sounds like someone is like yelling at you. It is extremely loud and relatively unbearable for the people who suffer from this. <clears throat> Taking a step back, sticking with cranial nerve 7, we already talked about facial nerve paralysis. Facial nerve paralysis, like we said, can lead to Bell's palsy, and if that progresses untreated, it can infect farther back on cranial nerve 7 and actually cause hyperacusis. So make sure you just connect those two statements we put together. Okay. A tightus media. A tightus media. Media meaning fluid is fluid buildup in the middle ear canal. So fluid in the middle ear cavity. And that will actually press up against the tympanic membrane, and that'll change the location of the cone of light. Cone of light is extremely important diagnostically. You could see a question saying, you have a patient complaining of you know, acute ear pain. When you look in their ear with, I forgot what it's called, I think it's called a sopingoscope. I don't remember exactly. The cone of light will be in a different region. So we can say like upper right or lower left. That indicates inflammation inside the middle ear canal, possibly indicating an infection. Good, so increased pressure. Now we need to treat this. So over here we're gonna say how we treat it. We need to drain all that extra fluid through a process called myringotomy. So for myringotomy, you essentially just take a scalpel, make an incision in the ear canal, or sorry, in the um, tympanic membrane, insert a tube, and allow the fluid to drain naturally. So far, so good? Okay, awesome. So, I'm gonna ask you guys this in the form of a question. What is the most common cause of adult deafness? Autosclerosis, thank you. O-T-O, -O, auto like otitis media. Autosclerosis. So autosclerosis, the way that happens is actually calcification or hardening of the annular ligament. And if you guys don't remember, when we have our stapedius muscle, it looks like a little horseshoe. Stapedius muscle will insert into our oval window through contact with the annular ligament. And then we'll see like our utricle and our vestibule up here and our cochlea is over here. Just putting that picture together. Annular ligament is extremely important. It helps with the conduction of those sound waves. <clears throat> so sticking on the same topic of our cochlea, a secondary question he might like to ask in regards to the conduction of hearing. If you unfurl the cochlea, it looks similar to this. It's like a little worm. So as you actually enter deeper into the cochlea, so meaning farther this way. So as we go, I'm gonna use a different color to show you guys this. As you guys go deeper into the cochlea, this is where we receive sounds of a lower frequency. So there's really low notes in your textbook. It gives the example of about 20 hertz. It's an extremely low note. That gets conducted deeper in the, in the cochlea. More towards the beginning, we'll have our higher frequency sounds. And in your book, it gives the example of about 20,000 hertz. This might make up one or two questions on your exam. Sometimes he likes to ask about it because he just briefly touches over it in lecture, but it's still important to understand the condun conduction 
Also, this can actually cause some injury of the ear if you listen to something that's too loud. It can cause excess vibrations and actually tear apart some of the cells. Okay. A little bit more on this topic. While we're following up, this is a cross section of the cochlea. This in here, we're going to call that the. Oh, thank you. This in here will be our membranous labyrinth. And these sections out here will be our bony labyrinth. So one important fact for you guys to know is the fluid that actually fills these labyrinths. So we have paralymph, and we have endolymph. Paralymph, peri means outside or surrounding. Paralymph is in the bony labyrinths. It's the content of the bony labyrinths. So our endolymph, endo meaning inside, is in our membranous. Now it's important to know like what ions are predominant in each of these fluids. Paralymph is mostly comprised of sodium. Endolymph is mostly comprised of potassium. And my favorite mnemonic to remember this is napkin. So N A P K E N. So N A, like N A plus, sodium, and the perilymph. And K, like potassium, is in the endolymph. So it's important to know the composition of each of these fluids. So far, so good. Any questions on this? Excellent. We'll move on. This is probably one of the second most important pictures on your exam that we're going to get to. The cerebellum. So... It doesn't translate accurately, but here in the second edition, it's figure 1041. So let's talk a little bit about our cerebellum. So the cerebellum has about nine lobes. And we need to know them. A lot of times he'll put this exact picture on your exam and point to a couple of the lobes and ask you guys to label them. So we're going to go through all nine. All right, so our first lobe is closest. I like to start you guys at the superior border up here right next to the um, pons. Because remember here we have midbrain, here we have pons, and down here we have medulla oblongata. So closest to the pons is our lingula. I used to think of the pons as like one of those frozen flag posts, and lingula meaning like tongue. You know, a lot of people like to stick their tongues to the frozen flag poles. So that's what I used to tell myself. For the first one, lick the flag pole, is lingula. After our second lobe, do you guys know what that is? because I had a couple people say it. Excellent. Central lobule. Central lobule. What about after that? Colman. Excellent. Colman. Colman is one of our largest lobes of the cerebellum. So after Colman, we'll see declive. What about after declive? Excellent. Folia. Folia. And these last four are the tricky ones for a lot of people. So what do you guys think about the next one? Tuber, excellent. Now this is a little weird. What I used to tell myself is folia. It makes me think of foliage like on a tree. And trees have very thick tree trunks. They're like tubes. 
So I think of like a tree standing on a big tube, tuber. So after tuber, what do we see? Good, pyramid. And then? Excellent, uvula, kind of like in our mouth. And then our last one, nodule, excellent. Nine, nodule. A regular SI attendee told me a really cool mnemonic for this, but I don't remember it because it was pretty intense. So if I remember it later, I'll post it on the Facebook page for you guys to look at. It was pretty cool. So let's talk about some clinical points involving the cerebellum. All right, so cerebellum. One of his favorites to go over is intention tremor. So intention tremor meaning whenever you make a conscious movement to go, let's say, like, pick up this marker, a patient will start to shake as soon as they consciously make a motion, as opposed to intention tremor where you'd see in Parkinson's where the person's just constantly shaking. So intention tremor is caused by cerebellar injury, so injury to the cerebellum. This also has to do with a lot of the fact that cerebellum is responsible for coordinating complex movements. For example, you guys learn about like extension, flexion, but when you have like extension at the hip, while you flex at the hip, while you dorsiflex at your ankle, while you like pronate, a lot of these complex motions are coordinated by the cerebellum and are actually lost during cerebellar injury. Okay. So let's see. A couple other ones that I wanted to mention to you guys is hemi neglect. Not exactly associated with the cerebellum. A lot of times this is associated with, I think it was, oh no, that's a different one. This one is still cerebellar. Cerebellum. Hemi neglect. So hemi neglect, meaning hemispheres, you know the earth has four different hemispheres. You have your like north, south, east, west. Hemisphere, meaning if you split someone's face or their person in half, they ignore their lesser dominant half. So for example, I'm right-handed. If I were to be diagnosed with hemi neglect, my person would ignore my left side because it doesn't recognize it. So we're going to follow up with it doesn't, I spelled that wrong, doesn't recognize non-dominant half. Awesome. So another one he talked about was astrognosis. And this one I think is really cool. So astrognosis, this is the one that is typically associated with posterior parietal injuries. And it's actually inability to recognize various objects based on senses other than sight. So based on touch is typically the most common. Inability to recognize subjects W slash O means without, without sight. It, a common example he gives is if you were to pick up a water bottle with your eyes closed, you'd recognize it's a water bottle. Someone with astrognosis would have no idea what it is. So to them, it would be a completely new, new object. Okay. So there's some clinical points you're going to see for the cerebellum. Make sure you do know these lobes. These lobes are extremely important, especially if you decide to go farther in his neuro classes. Yes. Say it again. He's not going over the entirety of the brain. He did note that you need to know the first 25 pages of this chapter where you cover things like reflex arcs and just like basic neurobiology. But as far as the rest of the brain, you don't need to know, which is why I mentioned those things, but it's not important to know. Just knowing what those clinical points are should be enough. Any other questions? All right, awesome. So this will transition into block five. Okay, so the cross section of the penis is one of the male external genitalia pictures you're gonna see. Okay. Starting at the top. Here you can see we have our superior dorsal penile vein. So it's the most superior vein of the penis. 
but these three are what we're interested in. So you can see we have our dors dorsal penile vein, but this is van. Normally I tell you guys nav or nerve artery vein. This is the opposite. We say van because this picture will be in black and white. You won't be able to see the color distinguishing. So just know V because vein is in the center. You have two arteries and then two nerves going alongside it. So dorsal penile vein, artery, and nerve, van. After that, you guys can go through just the structures you learn in lab. You have your corpus cavernosum, corpus spongiosum on the inside. Here's your urethra, these associated vessels. You don't need to know the names of these very small vessels. Of this being so far in the penis, this will be spongy urethra. This, again, is a picture that I told you guys is just, these are free points you guys need to get. So these pictures are really important for you guys to know. Again, nothing too important. Deep artery. Yeah, these are the main structures that'll be important on this picture. This one's pretty forgiving. He's gonna change which pictures are on which exams. So if I were you, I'd really hope to get this one because this one's extremely easy. <laughs> for the second edition, this is 334, which I'll probably put in the 350s for the third edition, figure 522. 352, I was close. Thank you, so 352 for the third edition. All right, and now we're gonna see the female genitalia. So external female genitalia, this has a little more to it. A Little more questions can come from here. So if you guys can see these structures, can you see those okay? Ish, out of focus? Okay, that's a little better. All right, so here you have our perineal body. Remember, our perineal body is the lowest point in the body. So it's our lowest point in the perineum, lower than the levator ani muscle or the pelvic diaphragm. So our perineal body, it serves as the insertion for a lot of these perineal muscles, like superficial transverse perineal muscles, bulbospongiosis, ischiocavernosum. Here you can see our external anal sphincter. So recognizing the genital structures, labia majora, majora, because they're the largest, they're the most exterior of the two. Labia minora. Here you can see our external vaginal orifice, external urethral orifice, and our clitoris. Here you have the propuse of the clitoris. Knowing the difference be between propuse and frenulum is not too important. Just recognize propuse is up here, it's the little covering, similar to the foreskin of the penis. Here we have our, the bulb of the vagina. Underneath that tiny little yellow thing, I don't know if you guys can see it on this picture, is which gland, Cowper's or Bartholin's? Bartholin's, excellent. We're gonna talk about homologous structures later when we get into in depth into chapter five, but Cowper's is in male, Bartholin's is in female. Those are homologous structures. So here you can see Cowper's gland underneath the bulb of the vagina. Here you can see the orifice where it exits. Again, knowing these muscles might be important. I don't know if he'll ask those, but here's the superficial transverse perineal muscle, bulbospongiosis surrounding the orifice of the vagina, and ischiocavernosum, so ischiocavernosus muscle. We're gonna talk about any pathologies associated with this area next, because we're moving into chapter five now. So no more pictures, I'm just gonna be writing. Okay. So starting with a couple random things that, again, are pretty out there. They have no real tie to a lot of things we talked about, but typically turn into questions. Are the contents of Alcox Canal? Alcox Canal goes by another name. Some people call it like the Pudendal Canal. So by calling it the Pudendal now, Canal, we can kind of guess the contents. For Alcox Canal, we have Pudendal, nerve, artery, and vein. So contents of Alcox canal. Alcox canal is an extension of the obturator fascia. So we're gonna see that in the obturator foramen. So 
sorry, let me correct this. Yeah, I was just about to correct that. What throws a lot of people off and occasionally catches me is pudendal nerve comes with internal pudendal nerve and artery, but there is no internal pudendal artery. Sorry, no internal pudendal nerve. Thank you for that clarification, which we're going to get into this in a little bit because I know he likes to throw an internal pudendal nerve and it throws a lot of people off for episiotomy, but that's a clinical point we're going to hit when we focus on the female genitalia. So pudendal nerve and internal pudendal artery and vein. All right, so next we're going to hit the muscles that make up the levator ani. So levator ani is comprised of three different muscles our pubococcygeus, our puborectalis, and our ischiococcygeus. Sorry, thank you. Iliococcygeus. Stuck on the ischio now. Our iliococcygeus. All right, moving on. One of the more important structures, I should say, of this area is the prostate. So the male prostate is homologous to what structure in the female? Awesome. Our periurethral glands of skin. I'm preparing this masterpiece of a drawing so I can show you guys some important structures. All right. So before we get started, different colors to label. This area down here, so these dilations, we're going to call them our seminal colliculus. So this is our seminal colliculus. This dilation down here is our prostatic sinus. Sinus just meaning it's a dilation. It's our prostatic sinus. Up here in green is a remnant of the paramesonephric duct in the male. Do you know what this is called? This specific structure in the prostate. It's called the prostatic utricle. So now we know paramesonephric or mullerian duct, one of the remnants in the male is the prostatic utricle. Beneath that, because this is a blind opening, which means it's, it's closed, we have two other openings. These are ejaculatory ducts. So those open here into the seminal colliculus. And what color haven't I used yet? I used all of them. All right. So now we go into the prostatic sinus. Here in the prostatic sinus, you have a lot of small openings. You have a couple around here in the surrounding area, like so. So these green dots are ejaculatory. Can you guys see over there? Ejaculatory ductules. Okay, so now let's talk about function of these. So we said prostatic utricle is a blind opening, meaning it has no function. Ejaculatory ducts are where we're going to see semen being ejaculated into the male urethra after they've gone through the vas deferens and met in the, um, in the seminal vesicles. The seminal vesicle secretion joining what is now, it's pre-ejaculated, so pre-ejaculatory semen. When it gets towards the seminal vesicles, it inserts its secretion, which is high in fructose. It's extremely important you guys know it's high in fructose. Because that fructose serves as the energy to actually start the sperm going. Because the sperm require a large amount of fructose to serve those mitochondria that power their tail to help them swim against the current caused by the fallopian tubes. So again, it's an extremely important fact to know about the secretions of the seminal, vesic sorry, the seminal vesicles, and they'll eject here, the ejaculatory ducts. Seminal so colliculus, we talked about this space right here is a dilation. 
And these ejaculatory ducts are where we're going to empty out the prostatic secretions that gets mixed with the semen. The seminal vesicles have a mildly alkaline secretion, which means it's mildly basic. Now, the prostatic secretions, so I always tell myself P, prostate, and this is getting a little bit into the gen chem if you don't remember much gen chem. Here's a little crash course. So P, I tell myself proton. If you guys remember from acids, acids are an increase in proton concentration. So P, proton, means it's acidic. The secretions of the prostate are slightly acidic. Now, I personally don't really know why that is, because if you guys know, the environment of the vaginal canal is acidic to help actually kill sperm. So it's a spermicide. And I, this acidic secretion is mostly meant to buffer the alkaline secretion of the seminal vesicles. But I'm thinking the vaginal secretions would do that anyway. So this is how I remember it, because I think it's counterintuitive. But your body knows what it's doing. So. Again, important to know that those secretions are acidic. Okay. So I made a pretty brief chart of some homologous structures that we can go through. Because homologous structures are going to be a very big part of this exam. So here we're going to have our male. Over here we'll have our female. If I happen to miss any that you guys remember, feel free to throw them out, add your commentary, ask questions, all that good stuff. So, we talked about our mesonephric and paramesonephric duct. So we're going to introduce Wolfian duct. Wolfian duct is also known as what? This way? Okay. So what's another name for Wolfian duct? Mesonephric duct, awesome. So Wolfian is mesonephric. You can use either name interchangeably. Now what are we going to see that turn into in the female? So I heard epoufron, good. On, on the epoufron, those little finger-like structures are called parapoufron. We sometimes just abbreviate and call those epu and parapu. So if I ever say parapu, you know what I'm talking about. Parapu for on. And there's one more. Starts with a G. Awesome. Gartner's duct. Gartner's duct. <clears throat> so doing it the other way, let's talk about the paramesonephric. Also called... Awesome, I heard a couple of people say it. Mullerian. Also called the Mullerian duct. So what are we going to see that persist as in a male? We already covered one of them in our prostate. Awesome, our prostatic utricle. And this one's a little weird because it starts with an organ we discussed before, our appendix testes. Going into our blood supply, the inferior vesicle artery in a male is homologous to what in a female? Vaginal artery, awesome. Vaginal artery. All right, now here we have our artery of the ductus deferens. Now females don't have vas deferens, so we need to know what the homologous structure in female is for the artery of the ductus deferens. Awesome, our uterine artery. And one thing I like to say to kind of help you guys remember that is if you have your bladder right here in the female, you can see that, yeah, in a female, the uterus sits on top of it. This angle right here is extremely, extremely important. It's anteriorly tilted 90 degrees any less and you have probable habitual abortion. If it's retroverted, you can cause habitual abortion. So positioning of the uterus is extremely important. So this would be for a female. In a male, however, you don't have a uterus, 
So here on our bladder, on the posterior side, here we'll put our prostate. Here we're going to see our seminal vesicles, approximately the same location. So this is how I recognize, or sorry, there's your ductus deferens going, there you go. So this is how I suggest you guys rec um, remember artery of the ductus deferens is homologous to the uterine artery. Okay, let's see what else I got. We already hit these. Cowper's gland. Is homologous to what in the female? Awesome. Bartholin's gland. A possible follow-up question you can see is Cowper's gland opens into which part of the male urethra? So membranous urethra? Awesome. So Cowper's gland goes after the prostate. So we have our preprostatic, our prostatic, our membranous, which is where Cowper's gland is, and Cowper's gland will actually open into parts of the spongy urethra. Again, not the most important fact to know, but something to keep your eye out for. Okay, so now we're going to talk about contents of inguinal canal. In male, contents of your inguinal canal is mostly the spermatic cord. However, in female, the contents of the inguinal canal are, so it's a ligament, good. Good, the round ligament, also called the teres ligament. So round ligament or teres ligament. One thing he likes to ask occasionally is the insertion of the round ligament. Round ligament will actually insert into the fascia of the labia majora. It's a very, very small fact, but sometimes he pulls that out. And our last one that we hit not too long ago was our prostate. And our prostate in the female is? Awesome. Periurethral glands of scheme. Or you can also call them schemes glands. Periurethral glands of scheme. Awesome. So this is mostly a brief overview of some of the really important homologous structures you guys will see questions on that have secondary questions that a lot of people miss up. Any questions so, so far? Okay, so I wrote here that it inserts into the fascia of the labia majora. Majora. I wrote majora. All right, so moving on to our support of the uterus. As we covered in lecture, you guys have a couple different types of support. We have our passive, we have our muscular support. One of the more interesting ones that could potentially turn into questions is our ligamentous support. Support of the uterus. So we have three different ligaments that will actually help support the uterus. The transverse ligament. You can also call it cardinal ligament, or it's comprised of the cardinal ligament. As long as you associate transverse ligament with cardinal ligament, you should be okay. So then you also have the pubo-cervical ligament. And this cervical at the end can be replaced with uterine. So it can be pubo-cervical. Here I should have written transverse cervical. And our last one is sacro cervical or sacral uterine. Okay, awesome. So these are the structures helping support our uterus. And while we're on that topic, talking about some pathologies typically associated with that. Round ligament doesn't entirely serve to support it. Now it does, but not in the same way. And we're gonna get to that. So these structures are actually gonna help keep it kind of pushed in while round ligament keeps it from going down. And we're going to actually get to that. So the pathology that is prolapse, prolapse uterus, is when, a, can you see that? Okay, is when a female patient may have had more than one child. You have, everything kind of stretches a little. And round ligament is stretched or you can say is compromised. 
here, our, ex our internal OZ, we'll say our internal OZ is about here, and our external OZ is here. External OZ will actually fall down through the vaginal canal and protrude through the vaginal orifice. So that is prolapse of our uterus. Now, when that happens, kind of like with those Glad Force Flex trash bags, you just have to re-pull the support tight. So you re-tighten the round ligament, and then you just suture it together. So round ligament is stretched to treat. Simply, you just tighten the ligament. Not the worst thing that can happen. Now, one of our other pathologies that we talked about is the habitual abortion. Yeah? Can you say that again? Not the round ligament. The, here, the external os. So that's that most external opening to the uterus will actually come down through the vaginal canal and protrude through the external vaginal orifice. Yeah, so then you can actually see it externally. Good question. All right, so habitual abortion. This one, when it's caused physiologically, we're going to say is typically because a lot of these muscles are incompetent. So habitual abortion, you treat it with the procedure. Do you guys know what it's called, such as an SH? the internal OZ is incompetent, specifically. Awesome. I think I spelled it right. Sharadkar? K-A-R? Sharadkar McDonald. So what happens with this procedure is internal OZ is incompetent. And to fix that problem, once the embryo, sorry, I should say, once the zygote has become implanted, you actually suture the internal OZ closed. Now, this will prevent that habitual abortion until the fetus is large enough to support itself and when it has a fully implanted placenta. So, you, can you repeat that? Awesome. So she said about 36 weeks in. So 36 weeks into gestation. Okay. So stepping on that same topic of pathologies of the female genitalia, we talked, I briefly mentioned, salpingitis. Do you guys remember what that is? It's awesome. Infection and inflammation. Infection slash inflammation of the fallopian tubes. So this can actually be diagnosed by injecting contrast medium in through the external or through the vaginal canal, bless you, and you can actually see the barium or the contrast medium in a healthy female will leak into the peritoneum because in a female the peritoneum is actually open because of those opening to the infundibulum, or the end of the fallopian tubes. However, in a female that has salpingitis, the contrast medium is held back in the middle of the fallopian tubes or wherever you actually see the inflammation. So here we again have inflammation of the fallopian tubes. This can also lead to ectopic pregnancy because of that inflammation if the fallopian tubes are closed and the zygote happened to be fertilized prior, it will attached to those fallopian tubes and cause an ectopic pregnancy. Ectopic pregnancy simply refers to pregnancy outside of the uterus. 
Either it can be in the wrong position in the uterus, because it's supposed to be on the anterior posterior wall. It can be near the external os. It can be in the fallopian tubes. It can even be in the abdominal canal. So these, pers they need to operate very quickly to make sure the mother doesn't lose her life. And if the fetus is far enough developed, the fetus as well. Okay. So one of the most common types of female cancers, or you can say of genital cancers in the female, are called lyomas. I think I'm spelling this right. Awesome. Lyomyomas. So these are the most type of the most common cancer in the female, and these are tumors in the uterus. Teratomas is just different location. Yeah, and lyomyomas are smooth. Usually teratomas are more malignant. Benign, it means they're like, they can be there and they're okay. Yeah, malignant means mal, in Spanish means bad. So those are typically gonna cause other problems. That, and make sure you understand if there's a locational difference. These are specifically in the uterus. Okay, so something typically not covered in lecture that comes up on the exam every so often is going through the process of ovulation. So ovulation in the female, we don't have ovulation in male. Yeah. We're gonna talk about ovulation in junction with menstruation. Menstruation is more of the overarching process and ovulation kind of happens within there. So days one to four of menstruation are called the desquamation and regeneration phase. So one of the important landmarks to realize in these phases is the fluctuation of hormones. So here, we're gonna have an inc or sorry, a decrease in progesterone and an increase in estrogen. I should start with this first. Typically, when we document the cycles of menstruation, we're gonna start after the previous Bleeding has ceased. So bleeding marks the beginning of the menstrual cycle when we look at it like this. So progesterone is low, estrogen is high. That will help stimulate the rest of these processes to come through. Days five through 15, it's called the proliferation phase. Okay. Proliferation phase, still mainly controlled by estrogen. So I'll write that, estrogen dominated. As the name kind of helps you guys figure out, proliferation refers to the functional layer of the um, endometrium. So layers of our endometrium, we have our stratum spongiosum, our stratum compactum, and then we actually get down to the stratum basale, which is not so functional. And then we get to our myometrium, which is the muscle. So those layers start to proliferate. We see more cells, the thickening of the layer. Again, this is more of a prepare, like preparation phase. Here, since this is estrogen dominated, we're gonna see ovulation. This is where ovulation comes in. And that's about mid-cycle, so anywhere from days 13 to 15, typically 13 to 14. Ovulation is when we have releasing of the oocyte. Oocyte means an egg cell that is not yet fertilized. So here we're actually gonna have the rupturing of the ovarian follicle, release of the egg cell, and then the infundibulum are gonna catch the egg cell because the ovary literally bursts and kind of throws it, and then the infundibulum will receive it and bring it into the fallopian tubes. <clears throat> so then our last cycle is days 15 to 28, which is our secretory phase. So here, again, we have an increase in progesterone. Progesterone starts to become more dominant again. Now, what this is actually gonna cause, 
going to cause angiogenesis. Angiogenesis means the formation of new blood cells, or sorry, I should say blood vessels. This is going to prepare the endometrium for implantation. So this happens right at the end, as you can see, of ovulation. At this point, the, um, the OO site should be a zygote, meaning it's been fertilized. And if it's ready to implant, it will implant on this thickened endometrium that is now having an increased blood supply for it to proliferate. However, if it's not implanted and there is no egg cell there to grow, progesterone will drop. When progesterone drops is when we're actually going to see the shedding of that endometrial layer. The shedding of that endometrium and those new blood vessels we grew is what causes the menstrual bleeding and is what actually causes the abdominal pain. All right, everyone's keeping up okay? Okay, excellent. We have a little bit less than an hour to go, so you're almost there. So some other, I think I have enough from here. We're gonna talk about the scrotum now, moving on towards the male. Layers of the scrotum are pretty important to know. So first things first, we have our skin. Then we have dartos fascia. We're going from superficial to deep. Sorry, I should have clarified that. Dartos fascia. There's also dartos fascia and dartos muscle. As long as you know dartos fascia and recognize it as the dartos region, you're okay. Dartos fascia is important because it does what? What's its function? Awesome. It wrinkles. It wrinkles as a thermoregulator. So thermoregulation through that process of wrinkling helps to moderate the temperature. <coughs> so then after our dartos fascia, we have our external spermatic fascia. Do you guys know what comes after that? Awesome, cremaster muscle. Cremaster muscle is the master muscle, and we're going to see why. After a cremaster muscle, we have our internal spermatic fascia. And here we can see our cremaster sandwich. Hope I don't have room at the end. And then we have our tunica, abu, sorry, tunica vaginalis. Okay. So from these layers, not only is it important to know the order and like any of the functions they have, but it's important to know where they come from. So skin obviously comes from the skin of the abdomen. Not like your skin comes from anywhere different. So skin, again, comes from skin. Dartos fascia, however, is from the superficial fascia of the abdominal wall. Again, not one of the trickiest ones. And here's my favorite section, the cremaster muscle and the cremaster sandwich. Actually, I actually had that in a different color because I like it so much. Cremaster sandwich is these three. So our external spermatic fascia, here external, is very important. I'll zoom in a little bit for you guys. So external spermatic fascia will actually see come from external abdominal oblique. All right, now cremaster muscle. Do you guys know where cremaster muscle comes from? Excellent. Our internal abdominal oblique. And as we covered in block two, internal spermatic fascia comes from, excellent, transversalis fascia. And our tunica vaginalis is an extension here of our peritoneum. Because remember, our testes are immigrants. They initially start in the abdomen, and at about week seven, they begin their descent down to the primitive scrotum. So with that, they take the peritoneum with them. Did you guys want me to leave that up for another minute, or are you good? Yeah, leave it up? OK, I'll give you guys a couple seconds with that. Yes. Desquamation, D-E-S-Q-U-A-M-A-T-I-O-N. No problem, desquamation. 
Are you guys good? Ready to move on? Awesome. All right. So we're gonna be keep, we're gonna keep bouncing back and forth between male and female structures here, just to keep it a little exciting. So now we're gonna cover contents of the broad ligament. Contents of the broad ligament. You roughly have about 10 different contents. So here I'm going to pre number. Okay, so one of our first contents is our uterine, nerve, artery, and vein. So we have our uterine, nerve, artery, and vein. We're going to have our ovarian, nerve, artery, and vein. Following up with our ovary, we're going to have our suspensory ligament. Keeping with the part of the ovaries. Broad ligament only covers part of the ovaries. And this is why the peritoneal cavity in females is open. It covers part of the ovaries, but it remains open at the entrance of the fallopian tube so that the infundibulum can actually receive that egg cell like we talked about. So keeping on that topic, we have our fallopian tube. I feel like it should say parts of the fallopian tube, but it just says fallopian tube. Ureter. So ureter would be where our urine gets drained into our urinary bladder from our renal system. Going back to our ligamentum support, we have our transverse slash cardinal ligament. Next we can go to our homologous structures and cover our epoufron. Slash para. I'm gonna just leave it para poo. Slash gardener's duct. Lots of remnants in the female. One of the most commonly overlooked is our fat, our areolar tissue. And then last but not least, we have our ovarian ligament. Good, so these are our contents of our broad ligament. He could easily ask which of the following is not a content, throw four of those down in one really random one. So it's important to know these. Someone showed me the mnemonic. Out goes puff with two P's. P puff, puff puff. So here we're gonna have our ovarian nerve artery vein, uterine nerve artery vein, transverse slash cardinal ligament. Here you can see Gardner's duct, thank you. Here we can see our ovari er, ovarian ligament because here we had ovarian nerve artery and vein, so on and so forth. If you guys wanna use this, you can. Pretty self-explanatory. Here we have our fallopian tube, fat areolar tissue, ureters, and so on and so forth. It's pretty self-explanatory once you actually go through them. Was there a question? Oh, this says out goes puff. P P U F F P puff. I think it's really cool. Out goes puff puff. All right. If you guys missed anything that I went over, I'm gonna be outside for another couple minutes. Feel free to stop by and take pictures of anything you may have missed, of anything I drew, of anything I wrote down, okay? How much time do we have left? All right, cool, we got like 40 minutes left. So moving on, another clinical point, an extremely important clinical point, is a procedure called episiotomy. If you come regularly to SI, you know I ask a lot of these clinically oriented questions to kind of get you guys to pick up these really odd clinical points. Do you guys remember what an episiotomy is? It's a surgical incision of something. Good, good enough. Great way to start. So it is a surgical procedure, so whenever we do surgery, we always start with anesthetics. So anesthetizing either the entire body with general anesthetics or acute anesthetics. Here. We're gonna anesthetize pudendal nerve. 
And this is where he loves to trick people up. Sometimes he'll say internal pudendal nerve, external pudendal nerve, or pudendal nerve. Or he'll throw something else in there like sciatic nerve, something in this general area. Just remember, there is no internal pudendal nerve, just pudendal nerve. So we anesthetize pudendal nerve, and we're actually going to cut one of the pelvic floor muscles. Because typically when a female is delivering and the orifice isn't dilated enough, you can see rupture at the perineal body, and this is very, very bad. Perineal body is a very tough structure that serves as the insertion from all those pelvic floor muscles. Injury to the pelvic floor, and this is a self-study question, so you guys might want to make note of this. Injury to the muscles of the pelvic floor can lead to rec er, fecal incontinence, urinary incontinence. You can also see prolapse because of the muscular support of the vagina. That's another good one. Those are the big ones. Just lack of support of those general structures. And if it's in a male, because for some reason, pelvic floor injury of the male, bulbospongiosis muscle contraction is important for um, erection. It's also important for ejaculation. So these, structure, or these functions will be inhibited in a male with pelvic floor injuries. Okay, but you're going to cut pubo coccygeus. The pubo coccygeus muscle will actually be severed in an effort to kind of relieve that pressure and aid in delivery. Granted, healing isn't that great, but it's better than rupturing the perineal body, which is an avascular structure, which would not heal really at all. Okay. So this episiotomy is extremely important. You may not need to know the name. However, knowing that in a situation where a female is having trouble with delivery because of the lack of dilation, knowing this procedure is extremely important. Okay. So sticking with the topic of reproduction, I'm almost out of paper. He mentioned this briefly in lecture, so we're going to go over it in a little more detail. Spermatogenesis, a process I think is really cool. Spermatogenesis. All right, so you begin as an embryo. You have primordial germ cells. Primordial just meaning it's the very beginning. Primordial germ cells don't really do much. Your primordial germ cells are going to differentiate into type A spermatogonia. Type A spermatogonia. Type A spermatogonia undergo mitotic cell division. This is why, as opposed to females, males have a limitless supply of sperm because of this mitotic division. So, type A spermatogonia undergo mitotic division. It's kind of hard to do this with arrows, but some of these cells differentiate. You always have a supply of type A spermatogonia, but some of them differentiate into type B spermatogonia. I'm not going to rear it, it's a long word. Type B spermatogonia. So, type B spermatogonia will also undergo some replication, but the most important part, the most important part to note is that they turn into primary spermatocytes. Now, primary spermatocytes, I'm just going to write here some more replication. You guys will learn this process more if you guys go to medical school, if you guys take embryology. So they undergo some more replication. Here, when you have primary spermatocytes, they undergo meiosis one. If you guys remember from gen bio, meiosis is a two-step process. So here, these primary spermatocytes undergo meiosis one and will actually turn into secondary spermatocytes. Okay. Now, at this point, it should be about month five of gestation. A female, sorry, we're stuck in male. Thinking about female, female's exciting. So you're at secondary spermatocytes. Secondary spermatocytes will complete meiosis two. And here, they're going to turn into spermatids. At this point, you, there's four of them. Four spermatids. Now, to go from spermatids to mature sperm is a very simple process. In your book, it describes it as morphologic changes. 
he mentioned in lecture, again, a little more than you need to know, but just in case, formation of the acrosome. Acrosome is a little pouch of enzymes at the tip of the head of the sperm cell, which will actually allow it to digest those layers of the egg cell. So if you guys remember our zona pellucida, which is glycoprotein, and our corona radiata, which is those leftover follicular cells. So at this point, we have four mature sperm. Success. Okay, so now we're gonna go over to the female side. Your anatomy book doesn't go into as much detail about this one as I would like, so I'm gonna try and keep it brief. This process is called oogenesis. So again, it follows a lot of the same trend. We start out with primordial oogonia. Primordial oogonia, which those will differentiate into primary oocyte. It skipped a couple steps in here um, with primordial oogonia. It follows a lot of the same pattern as this with males. You have mitotic division, then meiotic division. So we get to our primary oocyte at puberty. So at puberty, you have primary oocyte. Those at puberty will begin to differ differentiate into secondary oocytes. Here, this is how I abbreviate secondary. I just put a two and then n dairy. In case that threw you off, that's secondary. Secondary oocytes. Now here the secondary oocytes are actually halted in meiosis two. So they begin meiosis two, but they never complete it. What's actually gonna happen is when you have the oocyte be, um, being ovulated, it's gonna actually wait until it meets a sperm. Once it meets a sperm cell, then it will finish meiosis two, producing a bar body, which is essentially just a useless cell and then we'll have our zygote, which is our fertilized egg cell. This is why I say it, I wish it went into a little more detail with this because it's actually really cool. But at this point, this is what you guys need to know. So we start with primary oogonia, primary oocyte at puberty, those will differentiate, or secondary oocytes, where they will be halted in meiosis too. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, because here, primary oocyte, you actually have your predetermined amount of egg cells, as opposed to male, which when you're at your spermatocytes, you can still have constant supply from your type A spermatogonia. So here, I'll add that detail, thank you. You already have a predetermined number of primary oocytes. And at the end of the day, females are gonna have approximately 480 functional egg cells. I forgot how to spell functional. Functional egg cells. This correlates to about 30 to 40 years of ovulation. Okay. So far so good on this topic? All right, awesome. Let's see how much we got to go. All right, excellent, we don't have much to go, we're almost done. So, one of the more interesting areas of the male is the male urethra. So male urethra is broken up into a couple different sections based on epithelium. You know you guys have your preprostatic, prostatic, membranous, and spongy urethra, then you have the epithelium at the external orifice. So here breaking it down, our prostatic urethra epithelium type is our urothelium. Urothelium is also called transitional epithelium, and this one is very special because it looks cuboidal, However, when you have exertion of pressure onto it, for example, from urine or from here in the prostatic urethra, possible semen, they actually get squished and they form this almost umbrella-like top. They look like a big mushroom. So they have some give for stretching when there is compression because of fluid. <clears throat> so in our prostatic urethra, we have urothelium. Now in our bulbar, and membranous urethra. We can have one of two types. It's either pseudo, 
spelled that wrong. Pseudostratified. Or just stratified. Columnar epithelium. And our last change is near the orifice of the penis. That dilation called the navicular fossa is covered by squamous epithelium. I posted a chart on my SI site outlining a lot of the major organs for their epithelium types. So make sure you guys go check that out and fill that out. Because even though I'm not going to cover it today, epithelium is extremely important for this exam. It'll make up at least five, maybe like seven to ten questions of the exam, which is a lot of points. <coughs> okay. Little backtrack in a detail. Actually, we'll cover blood supply first. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to draw a picture for you guys. And in no way, shape, or form is this picture anatomically accurate, referring to the direction of the arteries or their size, because there's a picture of it in your book. However, it's extremely kind of like cluttered and extremely confusing. So I made this drawing to kind of help separate it so you guys can get origin better and you guys can get drainage a little better. So we're going to focus mostly on the internal iliac artery. So internal iliac artery, if we go back, is going to come from common iliac, which comes from abdominal aorta. Has two directly branching arteries. The lower one is the lateral sacral artery. And the first one is the iliolumbar. Now, so after this, we're going to have a bifurcation. This will split it into anterior internal iliac and posterior internal iliac. So from here, I'm going to change colors so you guys can kind of see that. Posterior is pretty nice and easy. Posterior will then branch, bless you, off to our superior gluteal artery and here our inferior gluteal artery. One important fact that you mentioned during lecture is that your S1 nerve root is about in this area. So this is where your S1 will come through. Just kind of a good like orientation fact to kind of help locate where you are. So here now we're in our sacral area going towards our, if you guys remember, our greater and lesser piriformis hiatus, lesser sciatic foramen, and all that good stuff from block one. So now looking at our branches of our anterior, one of the branches we have come off is our internal pudendal artery. Internal pudendal artery has its own branches. It'll branch off and give us middle rectal and inferior vesicle artery. A continuation of and an, sorry, internal, anterior internal iliac is our obturator artery. Obturator artery. And here, one of our last branches of internal iliac is our superior vesicle artery. A little important thing to note is that when you're talking about uterine life, right here is actually going to be called the umbilical artery. However, you guys know umbilical artery becomes ischemic, it dies off because you no longer have an umbilical cord after birth. So 
Typically, you'd see it branch off about here. However, this dies off. This remains unnamed, and we just say it goes directly into superior vesicle artery. So when you guys go through this, if there are any arteries that have homologous names, for example, we said inferior vesicle artery is homologous in the female. We also talked about the uterine artery and the vaginal artery. So make sure you guys kind of put those in this picture. But I want to go through some of the organs that these actually give blood supply to. Because a lot of these have some pretty interesting blood supply. So first going off with our bladder. So bladder is going to have both vesicle arteries, vesicle refers to the bladder. So we're going to have our superior vesicle and our inferior vesicle. One of the other arteries serving the bladder is the obturator artery. And then to finish off, our inferior gluteal. So next we're going to follow up on with male urethra. So male urethra, we have still our inferior vesicle. Then we have our middle rectal. And later on, internal pudendal artery. Because here you can see I left it blank, but internal pudendal kind of continues down. Now we can't do one without doing the other. Let's hit female. I'm going to put it right here just so you guys can kind of compare. It's relatively the same. Inferior vesicle we talked about turns into vaginal. Middle rectal does not serve the female urethra because the female urethra is so short. And internal pudendal artery is the same. It's okay. Internal pudendal artery does not give blood supply to female urethra because of how short it is. I just said that too. All right. So female urethra blood supply is pretty simple. You're probably not going to be asked because of that. You'll probably ask about male urethra if he does decide to ask about one of the two. Um, so let's talk about the vaginal blood supply. So we have our uterine artery. We have our vaginal artery. Now we have our extension of our internal pudendal. The blood supply here is pretty straightforward. It repeats a lot for these structures because they're so close together. The female uterus is pretty similar. We have uterine artery. And then we have ovarian artery. If you guys remember ovarian artery, and testicular artery before we have sexual differentiation are referred to as our gonadal arteries. And those gonadal arteries come directly off of abdominal aorta and the left one will drain where? Into abdominal aorta or somewhere else? Left renal, awesome. So left gonadal, testicular, or ovarian artery will drain directly into left renal while the right side will drain directly into inferior vena cava. Good. Let's see, let's see. Another important one is fallopian tube. fallopian tube. Great part is it's exactly the same as uterus. So we have our uterine artery and our ovarian artery. And now one of the things that's specific to males are prostate. So prostate we have our inferior vesicle artery, our middle rectal artery, and then more branches of our internal pudendal. There are some branches off of that, just called short prostatic arteries. Those aren't mentioned in your text, but you can see them in the picture. They're not too important because most of the major blood supply comes from here. How much time do we have left? Okay, awesome. We have about 10 minutes left. So I'm going to hit a couple of random facts about these organs that you guys might need to remember. So, sticking with the bladder, 
bladder at its average maximum capacity can hold about 700 milliliters, average, some people's more, some people's less. However, urge to micturate or to urinate, so micturition, happens at about 250 to 300 milliliters. He's not going to put numbers really close together. So knowing the window, 250 to 300 milliliters is fine for the urge of micturition. So a similar concept with the rectum. Rectum has no real max capacity unless we talk about Hirschsprung's disease. But the rectum, urge to defecate, is at about approximately 25% filling of the rectal ampulla. One thing I should have added, the muscle that controls this, the micturition of the bladder, is called detrusor muscle. That actually surrounds the bladder. All right, so now we all know Dr. Sam Sam's a neurologist, so he loves nerve questions. We have our, our sympathetic nerves that we learned about for GI. But we learned about our sympathetic nerve here for our sacral region. Do you guys remember what that's called? It starts with P, pelvic. Awesome, pelvic splanchnic nerve. Pelvic splanchnic nerve, do you guys know the roots? So S2 to S4, good, good. So, bless you. Pelvic splanchnic is sympathetic. It covers a lot of the sympathetic functions covered in this area. We're gonna hit a little of the derivatives of the sympathetic function once we cover the other golden nerve of this area, pudendal nerve. Is pudendal nerve sympathetic, parasympathetic, somatic? Oh, that's right, it's 2S4. Sorry, thank you. I'm mixing that up with something else. Parasympathetic, thank you so much. Well, I apologize for that, my bad. All right, other pudendal nerve. Wow, that's right. And I'm thinking about other explanations in my head that make sense for being parasympathetic. Thank you guys, sorry. So pudendal nerve, what are our roots for pudendal nerve? Awesome, same thing, S2, S4. So S2, S4. Pudendal nerve is gonna be a somatic nerve controls a lot of the muscular contractions, for example, bulbospongiosis muscle, innervates the external anal sphincter. A lot of these different functions we're gonna see. Now specifically in male, we're gonna hit erection, ejaculation, and emission. So, starting off with erection. Erection is predominantly under the control of parasympathetic. So parasympathetic, this will actually dilate those blood vessels. And a lot of people think it's increasing arterial blood flow that will cause the erection. It's actually increasing the venous blood drainage. Because you guys remember that large dorsal vein of the penis will actually help support the structure. While a lot of the lower veins will actually help, sorry, will actually help expand the corpus cavernosum. So emission. Emission is mostly parasympathetic or sympathetic. Awesome, it's mostly sympathetic. Now ejaculation. Ejaculation is the final step where we actually have the semen come out of those ejaculatory ducts we talked about, receive secretions from the seminal vesicles and from the prostate, travel through the urethra, then it becomes ejaculated. What do you guys think, sympathetic or parasympathetic? Awesome, it's both. Ejaculation is covered by both sympathetic and parasympathetic. Thank you. This is the one he might focus on because it's both and it tricks a lot of people. Okay, so we have a little bit more time. I'm gonna throw a couple more random details at you guys that I wanted to hit, but I wasn't sure if we'd have time for it. 
sticking with sympathetic and parasympathetic? Yeah. Okay. Hitting our eye. So do you guys remember our extraocular muscles? Good. So most typically innervated by cranial nerve 3, except we have two exceptions, SO4 and LR6. Superior oblique 4 means cranial nerve 4. Lateral rectus is innervated by cranial nerve 6. But the one I'm really interested in is levator, palpebrae, superioris. Levator, palpebrae, superioris has dual innervation. So innervation is shared by sympathetic, which is about 30%, and parasympathetic, which is about 70%. We have a parasympathetic nucleus here associated with our ocular muscles and even some of our different reflexes of the eye. It's called the Edinger Westphal nucleus. Now this is sorry, this is also responsible for what we call our consensual light reflex. Basically meaning that if you shine light into one of the eyes, both will respond and constrict the pupils. If you remove the light, both will respond by dilating. So typically you can see if there's an injury, and you guys should have learned this in lab, injury in the optic chiasm or at different points along the optic tract by looking at the responses of the reflex. This isn't exactly going to be on your exam, but it's important to know why the consensual reflex is like that. So just remember, signals from your eye are contralateral, which means they switch sides, but they share. So which is why they're consensual. All right, guys, your exam is on Monday. Do you guys have any other questions while we're here? We have a couple minutes left. Yeah? Sorry? OK, good. I'm glad you brought that up. Accommodation. Accommodation is basically how you adjust from seeing from far away to close up. However, he mentioned this is not going to be on your exam. You will not be tested on it. Yeah, I know. It's kind of annoying, but accommodation just has to do with um, constriction of the pupils to see something close up because you do not need much light and medial rotation. However, you don't need to know this for your exam. So I really wish you guys good luck. Um, my exam review from last semester is on YouTube. You can just go to YouTube and type in UCF Study Union, Z O O 3733. It'll come up. I covered some of the charts I posted on SI. On my SI Google site, I also posted a link to UCF SARC Vimeo, which has four two-hour videos of exam reviews done in the past, where they go through all the study material I've posted for you. So if you guys want a very, very good overall review covering everything, definitely watch those videos and go through all those study guides and fill them out and test yourselves. Yes, the link for Vimeo is on my SARC site. YouTube, just go to YouTube and look for the channel of UCF SARC. Study Union. This one will be posted in about five minutes on YouTube on that same channel. UCF Stark's UCF Sark Study Union. I'll write it down. No, but because those exam questions were gone over in the videos I posted on Vimeo. Ooh, and if you guys are still here and don't mind, there are QR codes at the end of the table. If, you, if your phone has that capability, you can stand, scan those and fill out a survey about how you personally felt I did as an SI leader over the semester and how this exam review kind of helped you. So that would be a lot of help to me. Thank you, guys.